Welcome. My name is Brad Patterson. I am a partner in the Public Finance Department of Ballard Spar. I'm joined today by Norman Goldberger and John Grugan, both litigators uh, in our, uh, both partners in our litigation department at Ballard Spar. Together, we are the co-chairs of the Ballard Spar Group's Municipal Securities Regulatory and Enforcement Group. This is the fourth in a series of webinars relating to the Municipal Municipality Continuing Disclosure Cooperation Initiative, or MCDC. Previous webinars have focused on the MCDC program, measures an issuer should take in connection with such program, and considerations that should be taken into account when deciding whether to proceed. Recordings of those previous seminars, uh, previous webinars are available through our website. Today's webinar will focus on what you will need to do if the SEC comes a knocking. The principles that will be discussed apply in scenarios if you decide not to report, but also to individuals if you decide to report. If you remember, the MCDC program applies to institutions and not individuals. We invite you to submit your questions and we will attempt to address them at the conclusion of our remarks. Next slide. As we have discussed in previous webinars, the SEC in recent years has taken an increased interest in, in the municipal securities market. Although issuers of municipal securities are generally exempt from the registration requirements of federal securities laws, they are not exempt from the anti-fraud provisions of those laws, and it is through those anti-fraud provisions that the SEC has sought to oversee the municipal market. The efforts of the SEC have included the adoption of Rule 15C212, SEC statements, their own statements about the municipal securities market, and increased enforcement actions against participants in the municipal marketplace. And as both Norman and John can attest to, this, there's an unprecedented level of enforcement actions in the area over the last couple of years. Next slide. The latest attempt by the SEC to further oversee the municipal securities market is found in the Municipal Security, Municipalities Continuing Disclosure Cooperation Initiative, or MCDC. MCDC was, um, um, was uh, rolled out in March 10th of this year, and underwriters, issuers, and lawyers have been grappling with it since that time. Essentially, the MCDC program comes into play when, during the past five years, an issuer has made a misrepresentation in its offering documents regarding its past compliance with its continuing disclosure undertakings. Please, next slide. Under the MCDC initiative, the Enforcement Division will recommend favorable settlement terms if an issuer self-reports for, for instances of making misrepresentation in its offering documents regarding its continuing disclosure compliance. Please note that these are the only types of misrepresentations covered by MCDC. Other misrepresentations are not. What are favorable settlement terms? Well, the SEC will recommend cease and desist proceedings that do not require an admission of liability. In addition, no financial penalties apply. Please note that the MCDC applies to institutions and not to individuals. Next slide. As noted before, the deadline for underwriters was midnight on September 10th. For issuers, it is December 1st. Once you decide to report or not report, the question that arises is what is next? And, to, and for that, I will turn, to, turn the time over to John Grugan. Thanks a lot, Brad. Um, as, as Brad just said, Norman and I are gonna talk about uh, what happens next. And this whole discussion assumes that the decision about whether or not to participate in this initiative has already been made. You know, in previous webinars, we have gone through some of the decision tree analysis that underwriters and now issuers may wish to undertake in uh, trying to determine whether or not to participate. But today's uh, conversation is, is going to assume that either the, uh, the entity has decided to uh, submit to the initiative or has decided to, to wait it out. So I'm gonna talk about um, what those who self-report might expect, and then Norman will talk about what uh, those who decide not to self-report might expect, and also what defenses they may wish to begin thinking about even now. So in the event that you decide to self-report, 
Um, the SEC has unofficially stated that anyone who has self-reported will be receiving a follow-up phone call or other correspondence from the SEC. Uh, that shouldn't be any great surprise to anyone. Um, I think that it likely is not. The SEC has very broad authority and through this initiative is seeking even broader authority indirectly, um, namely the opportunity to regulate issuers where the Tower Amendment uh, precludes regulation. So in the event that you have decided to self-report and you do so, what ought you be thinking about? To be best prepared for when the SEC contacts you, uh, we think that you ought to first gather all of your materials and documents. You likely have done a lot of that already, um, but you ought to have everything more or less laid out uh, so that way you have uh, the ability to have a cogent conversation with the SEC once the SEC is in touch. Consider your document retention policies. Ensure that policies are in place and are being followed. If an investigation is commenced, it likely will be that you will be required to retain documents relating to the investigation and to produce them. In connection with that, your IT systems ought to be contacted to ensure that the automatic purging, for example, of emails is not occurring um, and that other electronic records are preserved. Um, it would not be a bad idea to issue a records hold so that way you have some documentation about your efforts to preserve documentary evidence uh, in the event that you decide to self-report. In addition, if you decide to self-report, um, you probably ought to be engaging in some compliance training already. Um, presumably you're self-reporting because of issues that you have found relating to prior non-compliance that in retrospect ought to have been caught or could have been caught. If that's the case, um, because you're, you are certain to have the conversation with the SEC in any event about your future compliance policies and procedures, I think that it would be best if you already began to undertake that uh, type of process. So that way, in the first conversation with the SEC, you're able to disclose how it is that notwithstanding what happened in the past, things have changed. Um, individuals, as Brad mentioned, are subject to exposure uh, under this initiative. In other words, if you self-report, if the issuer self-reports, the protections that are afforded under the initiative go only as far as the entity. They do not go to individuals. There is um, likely a conflict of interest that may exist between the entity and between individuals who were involved in the reporting that is the subject of your self-report. Consider who uh, should be representing those individuals, whether they need separate counsel or not, whether their positions would be in conflict with the entities. If they are, uh, and the SEC has been pretty emphatic about this in recent years um, in response to company counsel saying they can represent everybody, including the individuals, get ahead of that and think about who ought to be representing the individuals in your case. Frequently, that's a conversation with your outside counsel. Your outside counsel will be able to recommend uh, individuals with whom uh, they have worked before and uh, believe that they you know, have a reasonable approach and one that's consistent with the entity. Um, but think about that in advance because it, it, it likely is forthcoming. Um, the SEC has not announced publicly how it will proceed. Uh, it seems likely that the SEC will establish some kind of matrix that it will take the reports of all the issuers who self-reported and combine it w uh, with all of the underwriters who have self-reported to form some kind of matrix so that way it can marry the two together, those who have reported about, uh, those underwriters who have reported with those issuers who have reported. The SEC could open an informal investigation, but that seems unlikely. Uh, Norm is going to talk about this a little bit, but informal investigations which previously had been far more common, uh, don't give the SEC any subpoena power. But on the other hand, formal orders of investigation do provide uh, the staff to issue subpoenas. We think it's more likely that when the SEC opens an investigation, uh, it's going to want the subpoena power in order to be able to stand, send out a probably a standard subpoena seeking documents from a variety of entities and individuals. Uh, the sending of the subpoena would have the effect of requiring what should already be occurring, namely the preservation of documents. Again, that's the reason why you would want to be out ahead of that. Um, clearly, uh, because of the SEC's resources and because of the um, 
already substantial participation in the initiative uh, in the, from the underwriter community, there is going to be a triaging of cases. Um, it may be uh, on the basis of statute limitations that are running. It may be on the basis of where the SEC suspects it can find particularly egregious behavior that will provide the interorum effect to the market that the SEC is looking for. Um, plainly, the SEC will review all the submissions that are sent to it. It has suggested that it will assess materiality on a case-by-case -case basis. Um, our experience is that many underwriters have, um, have reported in the initiative, but have done so without taking a position on materiality. Uh, many issuers are likely to do the same. We have heard from some issuers who have uh, expressed the hope that the SEC will read their submission and find it to be sufficiently compelling on materiality that the SEC will decline to pursue uh, anything further with the issuer. It's possible for sure, but that may be wishful thinking. The, the SEC has for a long time sought the ability to regulate municipal issuers and where both the underwriter and the issuer have self-reported and sought um, the SEC permission to participate in this initiative, it seems unlikely that the SEC would pass up on the opportunity to gain the ability to regulate through consent orders. Um, next, the SEC likely will contact all relevant parties. Recall that on the MCDC questionnaire, all parties, including Bond and Disclosure Council, must be disclosed. And it would not be surprising if for some parties that make repeated appearances on many submissions if they also receive subpoenas. And I mention that in particular because of the SEC's focus on gatekeepers, those parties uh, whom the SEC contends can affect the conduct of others and who frankly ought to know better, like attorneys. And uh, because the, the SEC and the Justice Department and other enforcement agencies have focused so clearly on gatekeeper liability in recent years and have also indicated their um, intent to em emphasize that uh, line of liability in the future, we think that uh, other individuals, other parties may be receiving subpoenas as well. Having reviewed the submissions and having undertaken whatever additional review the SEC determines is necessary, um, and again, there isn't an awful lot of time for this to happen. Many of the um, bond issues that are being reported have, um, were issued in 2009, 10, 11, and so there, there is a little bit of urgency on the part of the SEC. Uh, the SEC will then determine whether it will recommend a settlement to the commission. Um, it is not a foregone conclusion that it will. As the SEC stated in the initiative itself, it will recommend a settlement to the commission and this is a quotation, to the extent an entity meets the requirements of the MCDC initiative and the division decides to recommend enforcement action against the entity. So that quotation um, implies that there will be a number of um, self-reports that do not lead to the recommendation of a settlement, perhaps because the SEC does not believe that um, any kind of further action is required, perhaps because the SEC believes that the conduct that will be disclosed will be in excess of the initiative's parameters. Um, once it de determines to proceed, the SEC will contact parties about proceeding with the consent order and the other uh, elements of the settlement uh, under the initiative, um, and, uh, and then will proceed with the filing of those consent orders in likely federal court. So having talked about what may happen in the event that you decide to self-report, I'll turn it over to Norman who is going to talk about um, what happens if you decide not to self-report. Thanks, John. The beginning of this process is something that most of you probably aren't familiar with, never having to, had to deal with the SEC. So we're, we're going to try and take you through it step by step. And if some of it's elementary for some of you, I apologize, but we think it's necessary so that everybody gets comfortable with what may happen next. Um, the first thing that can may happen next, is, for those of you who did not report, is nothing. That is that the SEC has looked at whatever filings it has gotten, either no report whatsoever 
or a report from an underwriter uh, or an issuer, it could go either way, uh, and has concluded that the material in question is not um, something that it wants to pursue. That could be because amounts and controversy are small, because materiality is an issue, because the statute of limitations is expiring. The most important thing to know about this is that you won't know. The SEC is not required to tell you that it's looking at you. The SEC does not make public filings about what it is doing when it is beginning an investigation. The SEC can do all this behind closed doors, and it can open and close its investigatory process without ever telling you that it has even begun. So. The good news is, if you don't hear, that's good news. The bad news is, if you don't hear, they may still be looking at you. And so that's something that you just have to kind of live with until uh, the statute of limitations has passed or until a sufficient time has gone by that we know the SEC has taken all the actions that it's going to take. We would anticipate sooner or later that there will be an announcement about that, and that at the end of the MCDC program and its investigatory fallout, we would probably hear that they are done but there's no guarantee of that. So let's assume that you do hear something. What is it that you can hear? Can we have the next slide, please? Um, you can do, this can happen one of two ways. Um, either, as John said, you can get an informal investigation or you can get a formal investigation. Fundamentally, the difference in terms of how this has begun is that a formal investigation requires an order of the SEC and those orders are in fact obtainable by you so that you know what is being looked into. An informal investigation requires no such order. And an informal investigation begins with a letter, generally speaking, that is sent to you that requests a whole range of documents. Um, and um, we'll get to exactly how you should respond to such a letter in just a moment. But regardless of how it begins, let's talk about what you have to do. Most of you, as John said, already have counsel in place because you had to address whether or not to disclose. But if you don't have counsel in place, strongest recommendation possible is do not negotiate with the SEC on your own. Uh, do not negotiate document requests. Do not negotiate subpoenas. It is, it is a highly uh, specialized process that has its own verbiage and language, and experienced counsel will know how to deal with the SEC enforcement people in a way that will be to your maximum benefit. Secondly, particularly, this is always true given the MCDC process, but if there's anything that I can say to make it even more heightened, if you get a letter of uh, informal investigation or notice of a formal investigation, you must preserve all documents. In fact, the SEC will ask you if you've preserved all documents. It will ask you for your document retention policies, and it will ask you in specific, what have you done in response to this informal request or subpoena to ensure that we get everything that we're supposed to get? That is a major, major issue for them. And to be frank, sometimes when they don't uh, have you on the substance, the failure to preserve documents will allow them to prosecute you for some form of obstruction of justice, and that kind of problem is not the kind of problem you want to have. You can take a perfectly innocent issue, something that is completely defensible, and then wind up in a situation where there is an obstruction of justice. Yeah, I mean, that may sound incredibly far-fetched or so dire that it is inconceivable, but in fact, uh, there was a recent prosecution uh, in the Fourth Circuit of an in-house lawyer who certified compliance with a subpoena when, in fact, um, the subpoena had not been fully complied with. She was prosecuted, although she was acquitted at trial, but imagine going all the way to trial on that uh, on that particular issue, and we're aware of a couple of other uh, similar investigations right now. Uh, and so when Norman says that, even though it may seem to everyone that it just would never happen, it actually is happening. And the, and the reason for that, just so that everybody understands, it is sometimes very hard for the SEC to prove the underlying issue 
and as you all know, we've discussed materiality repeatedly, but it is much easier to prove a case of you put the documents in a place where they weren't accessible, or you didn't arrange to preserve them, or you deliberately destroyed them, that that's a much easier case to prove factually. And if they have reason to believe that there was in fact an underlying securities issue, but they can't really prove it, they will from time to time look at this document issue. And so preserving documents is, is really key. We have up here on the slide, preserve the attorney-client privilege. This has really very many aspects. One is the employee issue that John already addressed. You have to be sure that you don't have conflicts with, with other uh, individuals who are being investigated. If you do have conflicts with other individuals who are investigated and you have the same lawyer represent them, in theory that could pierce the attorney-client privilege. Similarly, you have to be careful what is said and not said to the SEC or you will waive the attorney-client privilege. It is very easy to slip into the habit of saying to the SEC, my lawyer said. You don't want to be in that position unless what you have decided to do in connection with the investigation is to make a calculated waiver of your privilege and to assert the advice of counsel defense, in which case you've waived the privilege for all purposes, and that is something that you can do as a strategy. But you should be careful of no inadvertent disclosures that will otherwise waive the privilege. And many times you hear from clients that they believe that they are in a situation where they are effectively compelled to waive privilege, and if they are required to do so in order to comply with government requests or otherwise, um, the government otherwise seeks that, that the privilege ought to be preserved, but that is an issue that's been litigated in every circuit, and other than the Eighth Circuit, uh, in the Eighth Circuit, where there is a rather old decision, the selective waiver doctrine, as it's known, um, has been rejected in every circuit, and so there really is no opportunity for you to say, well, we waive privilege, but only did so because we were forced to do so by the government. The, the fact is that once it goes to a third party, that communication is subject to disclosure. Can we get to the next slide, please? Okay. Let's, let's examine the path that happens if you get an informal investigatory letter. And John said that they have been relying less on this process, and I think that's right, but it's unclear what they're going to do here, especially given the volume. So it may be that some will go informal, some will go formal, and so I think it's worthwhile spending some time on, on what happens in that, that process. Literally, it, it starts by the receipt of a letter. It, it will say, we are examining the staff of the SEC or the enforcement division are examining this and that transaction. We would appreciate your cooperation. They may or may not tell you that a, a formal order of investigation has been issued. That generally, if it's silent, that means that there has not been one, because generally they're required, as you'll see, to give you a copy of the order. And then they will follow that with, we would appreciate your cooperation, and please provide us with the following documents. And these document requests tend to be very broadly, broadly uh, drafted. Can we have the next slide, please? Um, they have very broad fact-finding authority. Attempts to limit SEC subpoenas by going to district court and asking for a protective order are notoriously unsuccessful. Um, the staff tends to be reasonable plus, uh, by which I mean, yes, they are reasonable, but they do ask for more than you might even get in litigation because they know that in most instances, the district court is not going to get itself involved in deciding what is relevant to the investigation. And in most instances, the district court will, in fact, um, enforce any subpoena, that, uh, any uh, request for documents that has been issued. And so th they, when they begin informally, they make their requests as broad as they can, knowing that they can always go to a formal investigation and get a subpoena power. But because you are cooperating in the informal sense, you do have a little more leverage at this stage to negotiate the scope, because if you don't cooperate, they do have to go to the formal process. Now. Some people have asked from time to time, why should we cooperate at all? They don't have any power. They can't do anything to me until they get a formal order of investigation, so why don't I just tell them to go away? 
the answer that may seem self-evident, that strategy has in fact worked from time to time, but I don't think it's one we would recommend on an ongoing basis. Uh, the, the problem is that in most instances, they will in fact pursue a formal investigation, and having taken that tack, the staff's view of the enforcement division is generally that the reason you didn't cooperate is because you've got something to hide, and they don't take it very well, and they pursue you even more vigorously. We generally recommend cooperation with these things, but that is subject to a case-by-case -case analysis. As I say, there is no requirement that you, that you do cooperate. It is a request, and it means what it says. It is a request. Um, beyond the production of documents when, and the negotiation of, na of tailoring it and narrowing it and trying to make it more uh, user-friendly user to you as opposed to giving them the kitchen sink, which is what they generally ask for, they will also ask to talk to witnesses. Um, and they do this in an interview kind of setting. Um, they you can have counsel present and you can talk to the witnesses, but the witnesses are subject to perjury and anything that they say that is inappropriately untrue um, or somehow violates the oath will in fact be prosecuted and they are not hesitant to mention the obstruction of justice tool yet again. It is something they keep in their pocket and remind people of all the time. Um, before we get to the next slide, uh, we have a question, uh, two questions actually. Can documents be destroyed if they are beyond the statute of limitations? And what is the statute of limitations? The statute of limitations is five years for the uh, SEC to pursue damages. The Gabelli case, the U.S. Supreme Court decision, um, the recent one, uh, makes that clear. The SEC has taken the position that Gabelli does not apply to, uh, to injunctive relief or other equitable relief, and therefore it can pursue conduct that goes beyond the five-year statute of limitations, but in Gabelli, the Supreme Court said that it's, it's five years, and the Supreme Court said that the discovery rule does not apply. In other words, it's five years from the date on which the supposed fraud occurred. Um, with respect to whether documents can be destroyed if they're beyond the statute of limitations, I think the answer is maybe. Uh, it depends on what the documents are and what they bear on. If they bear on a, 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 a course of conduct that falls within the statute of limitations, um, I don't think that you can destroy those documents. Um, on the other hand, if you had a document retention policy that you otherwise were applying, and it was a, you know, I'm just taking a number out of the air, but a seven-year um, policy, you know, perhaps that would work, but you would do it at your own peril um, to the extent that those documents are implicated in the later investigation. Norman, do you have any? Yeah, there, I think the, the other question is a strategic one. The, the issue with destroying documents is not only what are you required to give to the government, but there's also the issue of what do you need to protect your case. It is, in fact, true that often documents that are older than the statute of limitations have a bearing on your defense. Uh, for example, a document that shows that you have consistently relied on the advice of counsel since the beginning of the time that you issued all the way through makes it less likely that someone's going to say to you, well, you're just trying to pull out this advice of counsel for this one instance because, in fact, you've always uh, relied on the advice of counsel. So it, you have to be very wary about destroying these documents given this inquiry. Given where we are now, in general, I would say that we are on notice, all of us, that that documents that relate in any way to the MCDC initiative or uh, issuances that you have made or been part of need to be very carefully examined before you destroy them. Um, I would probably advise that at this stage not to destroy anything that relates to uh, offerings that you've made because I, I just you just don't know what potentially could be relevant, either to the SEC or to yourself for defense. Yeah, I mean, how many of our clients have spent uh, hours looking through their paper files to try to find the notices to the dissemination agents, the fax cover sheet that, you know, um, that accompanied the, uh, the information sent to the dissemination agent? So, you know, Norman's exactly right. The, there is an enormous practical issue there, um, not just from the SEC's perspective, but from yours. So what what happens at the end of this process where you've given them the documents and you have uh, had your witnesses sent in and been interviewed, what happens at that point? Well, as usual, it, there's 
two ways it can go, just as we said when we started. They can decide to take no action, and that is not unusual, by the way. You should not assume that just because they start an investigation that they are necessarily going to bring an action. That, that does not follow. There are numerous steps along the way where this can divert out of the idea that they're going to bring an enforcement action, and this is one of them. If you are particularly persuasive with your witnesses and the documents are as good as you think they are and your lawyers have good conversations with the, with the staff and where you cooperate, frankly, um, you have, a, you have a, a decent chance of persuading them not to bring any action. One of the reasons for that is they don't want to waste their time on cases that will wind up giving them a black eye. They've had some instances in the last year, year and a half, where they brought cases to trial that were not the strongest cases and they've lost. And I think they are being more careful about what they will bring and what they won't bring. Let's assume that they tell you that they want to bring an enforcement action instead. Um, and if they decide to bring such a, an enforcement action, they may decide to do a couple of things that you can deal with them on. One is that they can start to say to you, we would suggest the following penalties and the following uh, way of resolving this. We're going to bring an enforcement action. That is, we're going to ask the commission for permission to bring an enforcement action, which is what they have to do. They don't have authority on their own as staff members to bring an action. The commission has to authorize it, but it is generally true that the commission will authorize what the enforcement staff wants to do. There are instances where the commission has refused to do so, but they're few and far between. Um, yeah, just, just looking at the composition of the commission right now, there are at least uh, three commissioners who have very publicly expressed the, the view that uh, the enforcement efforts ought to be greater. Um, the two minority commissioners are uh, the two Republican commissioners, um, and those are the ones who have been pushing back against a lot of this. But just uh, as a matter of counting the votes, you, you have a commission that's predisposed to enforcement actions. So, it, but before they get to that, that level, they will come to you and they will suggest, generally speaking, a, a resolution. Um, and the resolution can be virtually anything, including things that are within the MCDC proposal itself, a cease and desist order, no fine, uh, agreements for supervision, agreements for compliance, all the way up to a suggested fine, um, disbarment, all kinds of, of remedies that they have available to them. But they will, try and, they will try and do it by agreement, and you are free to negotiate with them in the same way that you negotiate uh, with any uh, opposite party. Sometimes they're reasonable, depends on the strength of their case, depends on what, how strong they feel, depends on their workload. A lot of things go into the decision about what kind of deal you can make or what kind of deal you're not going to make. If you, if you cannot, if you cannot reach a deal with them, then you still have avenues open to you uh, in order to, in order to deal with this. And because they will have to go to the commission to get a formal order of investigation. And in almost all instances, they will allow you to file a document that advocates your position, which is often called the Wells document uh, after the name of a case. But it is, it is the document in which you will articulate exactly why it is that you believe that you are not responsible for whatever it is that they are saying. And you will be able to load this thing up with your side of the case. It is the first time that you will really be able, in writing, to present an advocacy position. John, you want to add something? Well, no, it was just, just uh, in terms of negotiating with the staff, I think that uh, those of us who have been doing it for a while um, found it easier to, uh, to achieve settlements or to achieve results that we thought were more reasonable um, a couple of years ago. And I think that it's gotten increasingly harder. I think that for the staff members, they feel greater and greater pressure to take a harder and harder line. And I think that they do get some support from uh, certain commissioners uh, toward that end. And as a consequence, it is very difficult to get uh, what you might consider to be a favorable settlement right now. Um, so, you know, you shouldn't rely on prior experience, meaning from five years ago, uh, in order to gain any kind of comfort about whether or not you could achieve something that was that was reasonable. So let's move on to formal investigations if we can. And before we, and I'll come back to Wells' notices because, uh, and Wells' and Wells' uh, submissions because we will we will do 
um, you will be submitting them in both instances if they make a decision. The, the formal investigation process is, in some sense, uh, just viscerally scarier process. It involves formal undertakings by the SEC to investigate this matter. These are not put on the public record, but if you are a witness or a target, you will get a copy of the order. They will give it to you. And this does contain a subpoena, and this is enforceable in a court. They will negotiate these terms as they do the informal documents, but as I said to you earlier, they are less willing to be flexible on the formal subpoena document request because they have a feeling that if we go to court, they are going to get most, if not all, of what they want. Uh, and therefore, in the subpoena process, they are a bit less flexible, has been my experience. Um, you do get witnesses who get greater protections. You'll have you'll have a, a formal court reporting kind of, of um, uh, proceeding uh, where where you are examined. So it is a bit um, it is a bit more formal and a bit more uh, procedurally protective. But uh, it is it is a serious step for them to go to a formal order of investigation. And the conclusion of a formal order investigation is the same thing that happens with a um, informal investigation, which is no action, or they decide to bring an enforcement matter. Now, let me just say about both formal and informal investigations, so a point that John stressed that I think is important. You can fully expect third parties to become involved in this process, whether it's a formal investigation or informal investigation. And when I say third parties, if you're an underwriter, you can expect the issuer to be involved. If you're an issuer, you can expect the underwriters to be involved. You can expect other parties who may be, um, uh, have knowledge of the situation to be involved. You can expect individuals who were involved in the disclosures to be uh, subpoenaed, and you can expect others such as accountants also to be subpoenaed or interviewed. All the stakeholders who we're talking about all have interests in cooperating with the SEC because most, if not all of them, are regulated by the SEC, and most, if not all of them, want to keep the SEC happy on an ongoing basis. So you should expect that most of these third parties will, in most instances, cooperate with the SEC. There's nothing you can do about it. <laughs> There's no way to cut it off, and you don't want to cut it off, and in fact, Again, to stress the point about not getting in the middle of the investigatory process, you shouldn't talk to the third parties about the investigation. Particularly if you are the client itself, you should not have those conversations. The lawyers for those third parties and your lawyers can have those conversations in a privileged or at least likely to be privileged manner and in a way which will in no way obstruct justice. If you start having those conversations one-on-one, -on -one, those conversations can be turned. You never know what someone's going to say you said. It becomes a real issue, and therefore we hardly recommend that you do not speak to third parties directly, but do it through your, your counsel. Want anything, John? No. <laughs> no, no, that's exactly right. Okay. Although, you know, really the trigger, you probably have had conversations already with your underwriters if you're the issuer. That's all fine. We're talking about after you have notice of the investigation. Okay, let's go to the, the next, let's go to the next slide. I already mentioned the Wells Notice. So what are you going to try and persuade the SEC of? In some ways, this mirrors the discussions we had with you when you were trying to decide whether to disclose. What you are going to try and persuade them of is either that there was no misstatement at all, that is, in fact, what they say you didn't say you said, or it was unnecessary to say because it wasn't a fact, or whatever, whatever your defense may be. Or in turn, you might decide that, and this may, may have informed your decision not to report, that in fact, this was not material. If you decide to go down the materiality uh, road, you're going to have to justify why it is you think it's not material. Now, there have been a slew of recent Supreme Court cases trying to differentiate the issue of materiality from the issue of price, and I think it would take a finer mind than mine and maybe a finer mind than Einstein's to understand the distinction between materiality and price that the court is making. 
That being said, one way to demonstrate material, lack of materiality is to show, for example, that when this information was revealed, that is, in these cases that your disclosure was brought up to date and you made your requisite filings, nothing happened to the price of the bonds that are an issue. That is one way of trying to measure price. That is, under the definition of materiality, no reasonable person could really care about this. And the way you know that is by an inference that if they had cared, something would have happened to the price of the bonds. Most likely they would have fallen, and they don't. Uh, in our experience has been that in most instances, that, that is the pattern that is followed. It is not dispositive. The SEC has never said it is dispositive, but it is very powerful evidence that what has been going on here is not a real problem. To make that happen, you will have to retain an expert who can, in fact, do the study that will be uh, pertinent to the, the proof or non-proof of price impact. So that is something that at the beginning, you probably, if you get one of these notices, either informal or formal, you're going to want to retain such an expert. You can always say that you had no intent. It is important to remember that under Section 10B, Center is required. Remember going to back to what Brad said, the SEC has no authority to regulate you on a general basis. They are utilizing the anti-fraud provisions of the Securities Exchange Act of 1934 to get at this. The Supreme Court has made it absolutely clear that they're going to have to prove Center to use 10B. And if they're going to use Center, they're going to have to show that you did this on purpose. Now, that being said, recklessness has been accepted by every circuit as proof of Center. The Supreme Court has never explicitly ruled on recklessness, but everybody's anticipation is that it will accept recklessness. Recklessness is something more than negligence and less than intent. I wish I could give you more than that. It is sometimes defined as driving through the red light, even though you don't intend to kill the pedestrian. You're driving through the red light, so you know there's a substantial risk that you're going to kill the pedestrian. That's one way of looking at it. I suppose in this context, what one would say is that recklessness is knowing that you had to file a disclosure statement, but somehow not paying enough attention to it to get it done, and so you were reckless. That is a very close question and I'm not sure that they will ever be able to get to the intent issue, but, but it's close. It's, it's not something that, that will ever be a slam dunk. You can try and say that you were counting on other people to do this for you. You had reasonable reliance on professionals. Um, that does work. It works to negate intent. Um, it, it is something that is um, uh, sometimes works, sometimes not. Um, because your reliance on professionals is generally not total, You've, you, you yourself have in some way contributed to the situation, so that isn't always a defense. And finally, we have the issue of whether the SEC will proceed under Section 17A of the Securities Act of 1933, which is a negligence statute, not a 10b-5 statute, intentional statute. They haven't made clear whether they're going to proceed under 17. The penalties under 17 are generally less severe because it's a negligence, not an intentional statute. But they may well proceed under 17 if they can't get you on the intent. Nonetheless, under Section 17, your materiality defense remains available so that you can still try and avoid liability if, in fact, the disclosure or non-disclosure is not material as we've discussed it previously. Yeah, I actually think there's a pretty good chance that they would proceed under Section 17A. Um, but Norm is exactly right. The, the defenses that you have with respect to 10B uh, remain in place, both with respect to materiality, also with respect to whether there was a misstatement. In other words, for some of these issues that we have seen, um, the issuer did not make any representation at all as to whether or not uh, there had been prior compliance with continuing disclosure obligations. Um, the SEC has publicly said that it will consider the failure to have made such a statement to be an omission, but in fact, the, om the omission case law is much more rigorous than that. The omission case law requires there to have been a duty to speak and issuers do not have that duty to speak. Underwriters may have had the duty to require uh, the statement to have been made, but issuers do not have the obligation to affirmatively speak um, about prior noncompliance. Uh, 
uh, absent a continuing disclosure arrangement or, or any other kind of contractual arrangement. And so those defenses um, will still remain available to you in a Section 17 matter. All right, let's 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 assume for the moment that things do not go well. You have done everything you can to cooperate. You've delivered a very great uh, well submission, but they have decided to proceed anyway. Let's talk first about what could be the end result of that proceeding in the event that, um, in the event that, right, in the event that uh, you lose that case. First of all, you can get a cease and desist order. Uh, we, we know that. We know that that, that, will, that will consist of an injunction that says you may not do what you've done before and you will never do it again, and that's a cease and desist order, and that takes the form of an injunctive action. The importance of that is that if you do do it again, it is not, in fact, a um, another investigation by the SEC, but instead becomes contemptuous behavior enforceable by the court and contempt proceedings, which are more summary in nature than what the SEC does. So that's just something that you have to keep in mind if that happens. And by the way, that's true in these consent decrees that you enter into as well. They almost always have cease and desist orders with the court, so you have to deal with that issue. Second, penalties. Um, they, these are can be monetary fine, fines. There are factors that go into it, um, whether there was actual fraud and deceit, harm to other persons, extent of unjust enrichment, previous violations needed to such acts or omissions, and such other matters as justice may require. That means the judge has broad discretion on what uh, they're going to want to do. It, Depends on what view he has taken or she has taken of your behavior. I can't even anticipate for you what they're going to do, and it's going to be fact intensive. If there is actual fraud, that is, people knew that they could not file disclosures because the financial statements were uh, just totally wrong, that will likely result in greater fines and greater penalties. If this is an innocent mistake, somebody just forgot to file something, that is likely to result in far less or no penalties and fines. It is very, very fact intensive. And uh, you just have to know what the range is that, that may exist with respect to that. Norman, just let me jump in with a question that we've yes. received. The, the question is this. Under West Clark, when you have approximately a dozen instances where an issuer has what is believed to be non-material failures to disclose cumulative, cumulatively, can that rise to a level of materiality that should be considered for voluntary participation in the initiative? And I'll tell you what, the way that I think about it, and then Norman will, will fill it in. I, I think about materiality under the SAB 99 analysis um, about both being quantitative and qualitative. So you can have, um, th there can be an awful lot of, of proof that uh, a failure to have done something is not quantitatively material because it may not have moved the market. It may not have been, um, you know, it's so important to a, a reasonable investor that it would have affected the total mix of information available to him or her or it. But there is also this sort of qualitative um, component to materiality, and the SEC has stressed this a great deal. And that question is a, a softer one, and it really is what does the, the disclosure, if, if you had disclosed that you failed to uh, file any of your 12 prior um, disclosures, what insight does that provide you about the integrity of the issuer? Does it provide you with any insight that would make the um, potential purchaser of the bond um, concerned about the the readiness of the issuer to um, to honor its other contractual obligations up to and including making required payments? And so. I, I think that in that instance, in the, in the West Clark instance, where there has been absolutely nothing uh, that has been done to comply with continuing disclosure obligations, at a minimum, I think that um, it provides the insight on sort of the, the qualitative materiality uh, side of the of the ledger. Norman, what do you think? Yeah, it, it, I'd say the same thing, only slightly differently. There, there's there's a there is a doctrine in the law, in securities law, that you don't have to accuse yourself of bad behavior. 
Um, and and what, what that generally means is that somebody accuses you of doing something wrong. It's come up in the public company context. Somebody accuses you of, for example, uh, not purchasing goods uh, fairly. And then someone comes along and says, oh, you should disclose that in your, in your public statements, and you didn't, and, there, and therefore you committed a securities fraud. And the courts have pretty much said, under those circumstances, you don't have to uh, point a finger at yourself. You're going to take the position that you're innocent, and therefore you don't have to do it. The problem here, as John said, is the repeated nature of the violation, because where, in fact, it is true that you have not complied with your obligations time after time after time after time, it may reflect on whether or not people want to buy your issuance because you don't comply with the rules of the game, and therefore they would rather go someplace else and buy from somebody else who does comply with the rules of the game. I, I still think that you have a defense because in, in one sense, you don't become any more culpable because you've made, you filed to file, you failed to file, and therefore someone didn't know about a two cent difference in your, in your statements. And whether that is over one year or 12 years, it still doesn't add up to more than 24 cents. So in, in one sense, you still have a defense. In the other, it, it is a more appealing case, clearly, to any fact finder. And we're about to get to who the fact finder is going to be if you do it 12 times as opposed to doing it once or twice. So I, I think when you get to the point of having not done it 12 times at this stage, I probably would go in and, in fact, disclose that because it just happens too much. And, and you're probably safer at this stage. But, but you know, we should caution that, that it isn't um, – not all, every failure is the same as another. Correct. And so if, for example, just because of some oversight, a certain operating uh, data table wasn't included in your issues, but everything else was – and your disclosures, I mean, but everything else was, maybe that's of no moment. Um, but where you've literally done nothing, I mean, that, that's, we're sort of talking about that one end, the far end of the spectrum here. When you've done nothing, that's where you have to take a hard look at whether or not you participate. I couldn't agree more. If, if, if on a repeated, because of advice you got or just because it just happened because someone made an oversight, you forget year after year to file a, a data table, I think you're in good shape. I don't care how many times it happened, if you can show why it happened and you're not trying to hide anything and, in fact, doesn't really relate to anything of importance. On the other hand, as John says, if you simply don't file at all, that, I think, is a different set of facts. So you really just have to look at the facts and decide where on the spectrum you're going to fall. Let me address one more issue that I think is important that may surprise you. It's got a home court advantage, um, which is this. It turns out that the SEC has an option about where it's going to bring cases against you. It can, in fact, bring them in the United States District Court where you have some options. If they're going to try and impose penalties, you may well want a jury trial, uh, and you're entitled to one. Why would you want a jury trial? Well. For those of you who are uh, public issuers um, and, and municipalities and cities, if you have a jury of your peers, a jury of your peers may realize that penalties and fines and the rest are likely to come out of the taxpayer's fisc and therefore be more willing to not impose penalties and fines. Um, it, it's, it's possible juries are notoriously uh, difficult, but as I say, the SEC has lost some cases, and you have some advantages with a jury trial that you do not have with a judge trial. Also. The district court judges vary greatly in their views and in their outlook on matters. Uh, if you draw the right judge, you may not want a jury trial, and you may want to have a federal district judge adjudicate that. And if it's what we would call a lenient judge, you may well want that judge because that judge is likely to give you, if you do, are found liable, uh, less severe penalties. But the SEC has an option. The option is to go to its own paid employees called administrative law judges, and they can bring actions in front of those administrative law judges, and those administrative law judges can, in fact, fully adjudicate what you do, what is, what is going to happen to you, and those become enforceable as if they had been rendered by a court. And that has some obvious disadvantages since they are paid by the SEC. One at least would believe that there is structural bias in that situation. Uh, and, in fact, there have been two constitutional challenges launched to this process. Both were dismissed on procedural grounds. 
But very recently, Judge Rakoff, who has had other differences with the SEC, has spoken to the POI conference and has announced that in his view, the process of adjudicating SEC violations in front of administrative law judges violates constitutional separation of powers, is unfair to litigants, uh, that no one who was paid by the adjudicatory agency should in fact be the adjudicator. And as he said, our constitutional system has worked great for over 200 years. Why are we messing around with it? So that challenge is out there, but the, it is at the SEC's option. You can't remove it from the administrative law judge. And until and unless it is struck down or somebody's able to get an injunction from stopping such a proceeding, it is an option. And they have been going to it more often because they find they get more favorable results. And I think with that, we've kind of prepared you for what's next. And if you have any other questions, we'd be happy to answer them. Yeah, just shoot us an email, um, and we'll we'll answer the questions offline. Um, the next slide. <laughs> okay, there you go. We'll answer those those questions offline. Um, and uh, as before, um, we're grateful that you took the time to join us. Uh, we'll look forward to talking to you the next time.